Good morning, class. This is uh, day one. A little strange. I will see you all in person next week. But um, yeah, this is the very beginning of a long journey for most of you. Full year of anatomy physiology. It's great stuff. I will uh, get right to it. I have this uh, recorded for you so that you know, everyone gets the same uh, experience. And I'll talk about the class um, and then some introductory stuff, chapter one. You can you can read it and uh, um, learn most of it on your own, but I'll give you some big picture stuff to start us off. With. All right, let me do it. Here we go. So indeed, AMP one and AMP two uh, takes. Even with a full year, I mean, there's, there's so much to know. I just taught pathophysiology this summer. Just goes into a whole another level looking at um, diseases. Uh, but uh, we'll look at normal human anatomy and physiology. And of course, in there, I'll talk about many diseases and pathologies and issues to, uh, uh, to make it interesting. First of all, I'll talk about me. Uh, I think it's important. Uh, I'm glad that we're, uh, we're starting face to face. Uh, uh, somewhat, you know, blended. So this course um, will have lectures that'll be asynchronous, meaning that you can watch them anytime. Uh, and then uh, we'll have in person too. And uh, so it'll just be this, this mixture. You'll go to lab every other week and then you'll go to lecture either Monday or Wednesday. And I'll, every week I'll have a, a, a lecture for you. I think I'll try to do this in one shot, but normally I'll break it up into uh, a couple lectures so it's not huge. So first of all, I think it's important. You know, I'm looking forward to getting to know you guys. Thanks on the discussion board, just I'll be able to see who you are. And uh, I don't know if I'll make some kind of um, thing to help me uh, learn your names or not, but uh, it's, it's good to have some connection. That's why I, I love to teach. I don't love to teach because um, I like to talk into a computer or uh, you know, I'm, I'm good at communicating information. It's uh, a lot of it is that, uh, um, that, that uh, back and forth, that, that, uh, that connection, that uh, knowing, uh, you know, making a difference and seeing the learning. So anyway, uh, so you, to know about me, I, uh, I'm a biologist and uh, I collect skulls and I have um, beetles that uh, clean the skulls. It's next to our lab, if anyone's interested, they can, they can see it. There's a bear skull in there and some things right now, but uh, here's a mountain lion and a, and a little uh, domestic cat. And here is a, um, uh, a wolf and a little shih tzu or something like that. And I love the outdoors gardening. This is at UNE, uh, um, down across from the Marine Science Center. I got a little plot where I've got uh, a lot of zucchini now, a lot of weeds actually. And uh, yeah, I have a little boat and I'm uh, gonna go to Fry Island in Sebago uh, tomorrow, right? Yeah, yeah, I just know some people up there. But uh, do a little lobstering, a little, even that little tiny boat on the ocean. And uh, just show I'm a real Mainer, you know, I do that too. Um, it's my brother, Steve. Um, talk about him also, we talk about hair and baldness. Uh, I'm sure you'll appreciate that. Don't know if you'll listen to this. Uh, and that's my mom. Um, that's my wife, Lindsay. And um, yeah, she's a pharmacist at Portsmouth Regional Hospital. Just finished her residency, so she's just starting out. And she, she loves it. And uh, yeah, I can maybe be able to ride this to for, at least another month. We'll see how long I can push it, but I like doing that. And I liked good craft beer. I like good food. I like to travel on the tropics, things like that. All right. Um, yeah, there's a picture of me in graduate school, a lot skinnier, a little goatee going on there. I need a haircut. I was in Costa Rica for a month at that point. And that's my, uh, my other brother, my half brother, uh, um, uh, Charlie, lives in Austin. Oh, and that's, I don't have a dog at the moment, but I have a, Ash is, is, is our cat. All right. So um, I uh, was a biology major. I, I like to hunt and fish with my grandpa in Northern New York and um, decided that uh, biology, I would be pre-med. It sounds good. I'll, I'll start like that. And um, I, I got into it at Illinois Wesleyan and uh, it's a small private school. Um, and decided that that's, that really wasn't for me and uh, just went to graduate school. Got my master's at Illinois State and met a professor who, uh, who taught me a class with fish, reptiles, amphibians. I liked him and I, 
I enjoyed uh, going out catching salamanders. So I uh, did a master's in that. Could have been insects, plants, anything, um, but did that. And then when I got my master's, I decided I want to get my PhD. I was a teaching assistant. And I like doing that. I just want to keep going to school and learning and traveling. So went to the University of Kansas, uh, which is uh, actually one of the best places in the world to study tropical herpetology, 5,000 amphibians. And then my dissertation uh, on frogs at a site in a uh, rainforest site in Peru. Uh, so what they ate, looked at their anatomy, and did all these analysis, look at how they, uh, 70 some species can coexist in the same, uh, same place. So I teach a lot of human health classes. I mean, I teach anatomy physiology, just you guys actually, and then five labs, one Monday and then for Tuesday, uh, and that's it. You guys are my um, uh, are my students, and um, yeah, and I, I take it very seriously. I'm ready. To, you can email me anytime, day or night. Uh, I'm happy to help you anytime. I, uh, um, yeah, absolutely. So, did never be afraid to to reach out. I'll have office hours uh, after for an hour, hour and a half after Monday's class, and then Wednesday after class. Um, until until lunchtime. So I mean, um, visit or we can zoom anytime too. But uh, besides, I taught human anatomy in the cadaver course. So I, I've dissected a lot of cadavers. Uh, I know that anatomy really, really well, much more than I teach it, teach you guys. Um, and then histology, looking at microscopic anatomy, taught that for years. And then uh, yeah, herpetologies, my reptiles, amphibians. I'm e ecologist, evolutionary biologist. Uh, Comparative anatomist, um, where you compare, you look at anatomy in an evolutionary context. So look at birds and sharks and how it evolved and how things have adapted. Um, so I'll definitely put us uh, humans into context. You know, we look at things don't make sense if you just look at us outside of the rest of the, the vertebrates and see how we got to where we are, standing upright, having small jaws, et cetera, for our teeth. And I've taken students uh, to scuba diving, Great Barrier Reef, and uh, Madagascar to see lemurs and chameleons, and Borneo, uh, Galapagos Islands twice. Uh, so yeah, so I like going to tropical places. That's kind of my uh, another one of my my expertise. And interestingly, I've taught a I taught a capstone course uh, at another institution looking at disease and culture and people, which is really apropos to where we are today with the COVID. And we can add, man, the flu of 1918 was a big focus and see uh, how that came about and how, how we deal with that. So interesting. And of course, you know, lots of uh, biology, which I like even with, uh, with non-majors and majors. It's just, I love sharing that really cool stuff um, um, to people. Yeah. So yeah, here uh, we're gonna do histology in lab first and the lecture actually the next next one. So it's looking at anatomy, but at the microscopic level. So you can see this cuboidal cells and uh, all kinds of good histology here, I love it. All right, well here, I'll give you guys a, a quick quiz. What organ are we looking at here? It's from a cadaver. Um, it's the largest organ in your body. Yes, the liver. And uh, this is showing, uh, some cirrhosis. So we'll get to that. We'll talk about how you replace nice liver tissue with uh, scar tissue. Not good. And here's another liver from a uh, cadaver lab and you can see here cancer. And uh, yeah, all of this white is, 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 uh, is the cancer. And cancer is a, it's a different kind of disease because it's your own cells that are screwing up. So there's no antibiotics, anything like that. Uh, some foreign invader, it's your own cells. So in this case, the normal liver tissue is less and less of it to do its function, and that's what kills you. It's not the cancer cells are producing some kind of toxin or something like that. All right, I said big picture. I wasn't kidding here. Uh, when you look at, um, at life, think about how you would define life. Is it easy? Can you give me a sentence? Um, yeah, I mean, it's not breathing because plants are alive. They're not respirating, right? Um, well, breathing, I should say. Um, it's not warmth. It's not really, I mean, we eat food, we reproduce, but 
a Xerox machine reproduces, right? Copy machine. Uh, it, it's it's tough. It's it's tough. We know that life has a combination of qualities. And so, I mean, you know, a rock isn't alive, but even a sponge, which just seems barely an animal is alive, or a plant, right, or a, a mushroom. But we we intuitively know the difference, and it comes from these uh, combination of uh, things. It's highly ordered. Oh, but so is a snowflake, extremely, you know, complex and, and ordered. And uh, we use uh, uh, fuel, we use energy, but so does a candle. I mean, I showed that lawnmower there. You give it fuel, it gets warm, you can adjust it. It doesn't really reproduce. Um, but even if you push a, a big snowball down a hill, it can reproduce and fragment into smaller versions of it, right? But the way that life reproduces is unique. It has a, a DNA or RNA that are um, um, guiding it. And uh, this DNA and RNA is also the complete evidence. I mean, it's tremendous evidence along with, with other evidence that we all evolve from a common ancestor because mold on your, uh, on your bread and bacteria and you use the same letters and the, we have the same um, enzymes for glycolysis you know, as, a, as a bacteria. And so this, either it, they both came about identically um, separately, what are the chances? Or the ancestor had it, we've just inherited it. So we believe life uh, on Earth all evolved from one common ancestor because of this sharing of all these complex characters. Yes, so again, big picture. So we, we know life, it uses energy, it's highly ordered, has a way of reproducing, uh, it evolves, life evolves uh, in the big picture and uh, has regulation, we have homeostasis, things like that. So again, uh, one, uh, one uh, simple ex um, definition is difficult to get for life, but it's these combination of factors. Again, lecture one, you guys uh, talk about some very important things that we'll really get into, of course, is uh, water. You know, we, we're based on water. We happen to, to live on this uh, planet so far from the sun, just perfectly so that we have water. It's, uh, liquid, gas, gaseous, and solid form, and uh, we can't imagine uh, life without it because all of our chemical reactions happen in water. It's uh, even in the chemistry lab. We usually, you know, use well. I don't always use water. Sometimes you use uh, uh, organic solvents, other things like that. But um, it's uh, is is uh, so critical when we look at us. We look at our pH, our water, our solute levels. I mean. We come from an aqueous environment evolutionarily. We're born in amniotic fluid, and then uh, you are uh, mostly made up of water. So all reactions happen in this. And uh, carries our, our blood is mostly water. You get the idea. Um, uh, yeah, we need uh, energy. Uh, we gotta steal it. We gotta eat other animals or eat plants that have made the energy. So um, we can't photosynthesize, you know? So. All life on Earth depends on, uh, on, on plants or algae uh, uh, as the, uh, the basis to, to make all the complexity above it. Uh, well, oxygen, of course, talk about a lot of that in respiration, uh, but we'll talk about it right away in, in cellular respiration. Turns out we need it for our, uh, uh, to make enough ATP, enough energy, uh, but there are other organisms, anaerobic bacteria that die with oxygen. Oxygen is pretty toxic, and um, early Earth didn't have much oxygen, but Earth actually life produced oxygen and killed off a lot of things because it's pretty nasty stuff, makes you rust and things like that. Um, and then eventually, uh, we have evolved to 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 need oxygen in order to extract enough energy from uh, from sugars. And then heat and pressure, definitely. Pressure we'll talk about a lot with the uh, cardiovascular system, looking at the hearts. Things go from a higher to lower pressure. Same thing with breathing. Yeah, so pressures and uh, yeah, we need, we're heat. We'll talk about our body temperature needs to be high for uh, enzymatic reactions to happen optimally too. All right, how are we doing? Uh, again, uh, in person, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be doing this uh, next time, but um, some of it will be uh, uh, given like this. You can probably see my little head up there, right? All right, so um, looking at uh, chapter one, this hierarchy, and, and life is hierarchical. 
Um, it doesn't have to be that way. It could be all animals are just randomly distributed, but you all know there's cat family, dog family, horse family. You know a zebra and a horse are closely related, right? And that's a black bear and a grizzly bear are. Why is that? If we were all created separately, there wouldn't be this, this hierarchy, that's right? Um, but we believe that life evolved from a common ancestor and it moved up. And so why a horse and zebra are most closely look the most alike is because they in fact um, have a common ancestor more recent than a horse and a cat. Basic evolution stuff here. But looking at this, um, uh, we're going to be looking at, uh, of course, the whole organism would be, you know, would be you, for instance. And, and uh, uh, I guess stepping the other direction, the atom can even be split right into subatomic particles, but let's not go there. Uh, we put them together in molecules, and uh, you'll see in life in this class that we'll look at these uh, big macromolecules, this, you know, looking at organic chemistry. Uh, things like insulin here or uh, thyroid hormone, these big complex molecules, right? Even the keratin that makes up your hair. And then uh, a cell can live on its own, a single cell. Um, we're multicellular creatures, so our cells can't live on their own. Uh, they need the other cells, the other trillion cells to, uh, to help uh, contribute to that. But within a cell are organelles, like the mitochondria, the nucleus, the Golgi, these, these different parts. And, and they're just little, means a little organ of a cell, right? Now you put a bunch of cells together uh, to do some kind of common function, it's a tissue. And that's histology. So we'll be looking at that level. We'll be looking at the level of cells and, and below as well. And an organ like a heart or a stomach or a spleen, uh, a bone is an organ. These organs are made up of many tissues, right? So your heart's not just cardiac muscle, it's blood, it's nervous tissue, it's fat, it's connective tissue, all these things are, uh, tissues are within an organ. And organ systems we can put together, like digestive system, circulatory system, where we can, we can add different organs together. And going up above that, you know, the organism, I stopped there, right? But if you have, several of us together, like in a classroom, uh, then you've got a, a, a population. You have a population of one species, like all the deer here in Cumberland County is a population. And then you add the deer and then the, the coyotes and then the birds and then the plants and then the microbes, it makes up a community. So communities may different species. And then the ecosystem is when you add in things like the soil and the water and things like that. And lastly, the biggest one is the biosphere. And that's all life as we know it occurs on a thin film on this third planet from the sun. Um, uh, there's life high in the atmosphere where there's spiders flying around to deep in the earth. As long as there's water, there'd be some bacteria. So this, this is where life occurs as far as we know it in the universe. Oh, beautiful chickadee. Um, and as you go up in these levels, I'll talk about that, more interesting things can happen. Because if you're an organism, yeah, I can go shoot hoops by myself, you know, I can uh, uh, think, I can read a book, right? But you add a couple more people, then all of a sudden you can have fighting or, uh, or uh, affection or uh, competition for food. Uh, you can start running drills, you know, run plays instead of just having a, doing layups by yourself. And you can imagine, then you add community, like, oh my God, then you've got predators and prey and com competitors that are different species. So as you go up in these levels, you have more complex things emerge, don't they? And that's what I'm talking about here. Emergent properties come about uh, with complexity, meaning that you are more than the sum of your parts. Um, I guess nothing really says this more than if you think about your brain and all you can do with it, you can write poetry and, uh, and uh, instruction manuals and you can, you can uh, think philosophy and you can, you can uh, do all these things, right? But you take that same brain with all those memories and all those abilities and you just hit it. You have a brain injury. You just hit it really hard. All of a sudden, you've lost all of it. It can do none of those functions. And the only reason, it's the same thing, you know, the moment before and the moment after that impact, but you've disrupted that complex uh, uh, um, 
the complex um, arrangement. You just comp once you get rid of that, then you've lost all those emergent properties. And so this complexity, as you go up in these levels, these things emerge. You're able to do new things. Like I said, by yourself, you can shoot layups, but you have more people, you can run plays and such. Same thing with the human body. You can look at it piece by piece, and we will, we'll, we'll zero in. But you start adding things together and you have these emergent properties that come about. So we are incredibly complex life, humans. And it comes about because of this complexity, these levels, these, these arrangements that have come together that allow these things to happen. So you can, you can even take a bike and you can put the parts on a table, you know, and you can do, you can roll parts on the table and such, but you put it together and you can do, you know, wheelies and you know, off-road stuff and all these things. So, yeah. So we are definitely more than the sum of our parts. Um, and once you start uh, 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 adding more complexity, uh, properties emerge. I think I got that. And as an example, it's, you know, looking at us humans, you can break us down on the table. You could put all of our component parts, all of our chemicals. And it turns out we, we, we kind of figured out what percentage are oxygen and hydrogen and phosphorus and, and magnesium, all these things. And um, again, on the table, some of these would be gases and some would be uh, um, uh, solids at room temperature, but that's what we're made out of. And you think to yourself, okay, yeah. You know, these chemicals on the table are not you. They cannot, you know, do what you can do. They cannot show love and make music and do all these things, right? Because they're just chemicals. But think about the way they're arranged in your body and how much more complex that is, right? And then I've seen a lot of estimates here. What are you really worth, you know, like chemicals? And yeah, it's not that much. And you can, you can look these things up. This is how we... In the chemistry lab, how they, they order different chemicals from these companies, and you can see that rubidium is worth ten thousand dollars a kilogram, chlorine is worth a dollar a kilogram. But you can't work out what you're worth chemically, but you're worth a lot more than that. Just think about your college education you're paying for now. You're, you're much these chemicals. You're worth much more than that because you're building those connections in your mind. All right, so. Um, anatomy and physiology. That's the title of this, uh, this class. Um, there's an anatomy, physiology, and pathophysiology class. Or you could take anatomy, physiology, and then a separate pathophysiology. Pathology is disease. And so um, um, that's something else that we will, of course, you know, delve into here and there. But this class, we want to make sure you understand the anatomy, which is uh, how you're put together, the, the morphology. It means the the your parts how they're put together where they are and then physiology is the functioning a lot of physiology is looking at chemistry really and the, the line between cell biology and biochemistry there really is no line i, I have friends that are uh, organic chemists or biochemists and then cell biologists it's we are just chemical reactions when we come down to it we are looking at some pharmacy example we're a bag of salt water and uh, chemical reactions take place within us. I know we like to think that we're special and that our minds, yeah, but, but we are just chemical reactions, absolutely. And anatomy uh, can be pretty straightforward. It's often like learning a map. When I teach you muscles and bones, it's kind of boring to teach really because it's, uh, it's like teaching a map, like, oh, you know, your humerus is here, your radius, your ulna, eh, I'll make it interesting, but um, you can kind of learn that stuff. Physiology, is, uh, is much more, is changing much more. Uh, the more we learn about genetics and DNA and uh, the more tools we get, we can delve deeper. Anatomy often, you know, we, we're not gonna discover a lot of new bones and muscles, right? So that gross anatomy uh, doesn't change much, you know, but your textbook has to keep changing because we keep learning new things about physiology in particular. Also, big picture. When we look at a, we look at the human body, um, um, that we uh, cannot become, you know, anything that we want. There's going to be physical constraints when you look at a body, and and you'll see, like us walking upright, why we have back problems and knee problems, things like that. We can't. It's not just like we can dream it, we can be it. No, we we are organisms that are reproducing. We leave babies, and we make subtle changes along the way over generations. Um, but uh, when we look at us, uh, we look at our arms, our, our, our anatomy and physiology, 
you're not going to see perfection. You're going to see compromises. You're going to see uh, this is what um, a seal cannot be great at swimming and on land. So it's it's kind of awkward on land. You know, it's a little better in the ocean. But you know, we, we, we there's hard to get a perfection. Yeah, it's just depends on the environment. So this, I know. Uh, go ahead. You can you can quote me, but uh, you cannot become anything you want. Someone tells you, Jeff, you can be anything you want. I cannot. I'm going to burst your bubble. You cannot. Okay, you could say, could I win the Boston Marathon? But I, Jeff, if you train, just start training, you know, work really hard, and you can do it. I cannot ever win the Boston Marathon. I am not built for it. I do not have the genetics for it, all right? You're thinking, uh, I could play for the Patriots. Well, you better have genetics that allow you to be big enough and, and, and have these things. Um, and often you talk about, you know, I, I want to uh, be a doctor. I want to do this or that. Oh, listen to me. But um, you need to have not only the, the ability and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the work ethic, ethic and, and uh, the desire. And sometimes you can have the desire, but not the ability. And uh, sometimes the ability and not the desire, right? So when you guys, again, this is, I'm talking to you. I always, I talk big picture often. When you look at what you want to do with your lives, you need to look at, you know, what am I good at? I need to be good at it. And then have an interest in it. And uh, is that option out there? You know, I want to be a superhero. Well, you know, there's not a lot of jobs for that, but um, you want to look where that intersects and that's when you'd be happiest. Uh, I'm very happy uh, and being a professor, I'm very, you know, it's very laid back. I do what I love. I love you know, uh, teaching and research and travel and, uh, and having lots of time off. And so um, for me, you know, you know, being in a cubicle is not something and working nine to five, not something that I'm, I like, you know, it's just, so, all right, I digress. So indeed, when you look at uh, these uh, monster movies or these giant crabs, you know, that are the size of a bus or King Kong moving around, that actually physically couldn't happen. Uh, when you get that large, you can't just scale up when you get some, people say, oh, a flea can jump over a building. No, a flea can jump so much, I could jump over a building. No, you can't just scale up like that. Uh, things change with scale has to do with you guys, uh, um, uh, your bones, the cross-sectional area, you guys are, are three-dimensional. Um, and so you couldn't, this creature like this couldn't move on land because it's just the muscles and the, and the bones would have to be, the bones have to be so thick that uh, it wouldn't be able to move like this. So you can't take a mouse and make an elephant just by making the mouse bigger, like, you know, tell the Xerox machine, 150%, 150% make it bigger. You, it's, there's a fundamental difference uh, as you scale up. So yeah, an elephant, no matter how much it would love to fly, uh, it's going to be constrained by its, uh, by its anatomy. So yes, uh, when you look out there, you often look at the variety, the beautiful diversity of dolphins and, and uh, look at bats, you know, among the mammals and horses versus a, a raccoon and humans. And you look at our our opposable thumbs. You look at all these designs out there and just realize that, you know, looking at, just looking at our, our at humans, we're going to focus in this class, is that uh, we are the products of uh, millions of years of selection. And uh, natural selection is going to choose, interesting, uh, looking, think about blue eyes, think about our ability to digest milk. These are pretty recent things uh, that came about as, a, as a mutations that had a some kind of selective advantage, and then we had more babies, those people that could digest milk, and it spread. And that's how we come about. Um, we can't just stop and start from scratch. Like, let's say you, you're designing an airplane or a car, you can just say, okay, we're gonna start, we're gonna make a blueprint. For us, it's like working on a car while it's still running. If you stopped it, you'd go extinct. It's continually, you're, you're having babies, having all these variations and they're being selected upon. But uh, we are just incremental steps. We can't just stop and build a human from scratch. So people are often unhappy when you, you see the, the humans aren't perfect. You know, you see all these uh, issues and appendix and wisdom teeth that are issues. We have back problems and knee problems. Well, who would design it like this? And we, we're just the products of tinkering, of changes as you go along. And usually a lot of mutations are bad and they're selected against, but occasionally there are good ones. 
and those are going to have an advantage and leave more babies. All right. So from day one, I want you to understand um, that uh, when you look at the human body, look at the physiology or the anatomy, and you're going to expect perfection and, and answers, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to see that we are the product of tinkering, which is really having lots of babies and seeing how they react to the environment, who leaves more babies. It's very simple. Um, but over long periods of time, we get these huge brains and this hairlessness and this blaring so we can speak. Uh, it's it's a, a wondrous and amazing, but we came by through these small changes without any thought towards the end, just what can leave more babies during the current environment. Woo! All right, uh, big office fan, I love Pam, you know, but uh, so like I said, to think of when we look at uh, human anatomy and physiology, things are not always going to make sense. They're going to take these weird paths. You're going to think, why is this this way? And uh, you've got to keep in mind that um, we are um, uh, the product of these uh, forces of simple natural selection over hundreds of thousands of generations uh, is where we come about. All right, I think I'll tell, uh, I will, uh, um, yeah, we'll continue this. Uh, the, we definitely need a break. Yeah, this is a long, you guys are, are patient. Um, but let me tell you this, this is fascinating. That keyboard on your phone, on your computer, it starts out Q-W-E-R-T-Y up on top, right? So you're like, how did you know? Because they all do. <laughs> I'm not that smart. Um, why is that? Well, of course, it has to be the most efficient, right? Someone figured out that most people are right-handed and that, that middle row is your home row, so you wanna put the, the letters used most on that. And the letters used least, maybe your pinky on your weak hand. So someone came up with this, right? Uh, yeah, it's gotta be, right? <laughs> All right, I'm gonna tell you, this keyboard was purposely made to be not efficient, to slow you down. Did you know that? This is what it was developed for, this typewriter. And in the 1800s, when you use this typewriter, these little bars would come up. And if you type too fast, the bars would stick. You'd have to stop, pull the bars back, and continue. So they actually separated some keys out. So you didn't do two keys really close by, and you'd have to stick. Oh, well, our computers, can, we can go as fast as we want. This is not longer a problem. So we, we fixed it, right? No, no. We continue using the QWERTY keyboards. Um, even though we came up with this much more efficient, look at this, it has the, the letters you use the most and the strongest fingers. And you guys, you can Google this, look at Dvorak keyboard and you can do a simulation and see that your, your fingers travel you know, 16 miles for every mile they do on your keyboard and on this more efficient one. So why don't we use the more efficient one? You can buy this one. You can buy it. You can buy the Dvorak keyboard. Well, you guys get any idea why we don't use the more efficient one? Just like the metric system. There's no reason that us in England, maybe one other country, goes with, you know, uh, uh, three sixteenth of an inch pounds and uh, all this crazy English pints, you know, instead of using milliliters and then liters and then meters and milliliters, you know, that's the way we should be doing it. But to do that, we would have to switch over. And uh, we think about Americans today, we have enough trouble just, you know, doing anything, let alone switching to the metric system, right? Um, so uh, same kind of thing. It's uh, simply that uh, we are so used to it that the, the pain involved in going over to a different keyboard, because then every time you go to a new keyboard now, you know where the keys are. You don't have to even look. And so to do this would be a big pain. And uh, just like in our, our evolution, we have things in our body, our physiology or anatomy that works. And as long as it works, it, it can continue on. I mean, you can tinker if you have a better version, you know, a slight modification, that will leave more babies and you will, that will, will, you'll go in that direction. But in order to go all the way back to a whole different system is such a painful thing. And so difficult in evolution to do that and difficult in our society to change to, to this. All right, so you guys, your phone, your keyboards, your, your everything, you're using this inefficient uh, method that uh, you definitely should not be using. 
All right. I think I think I'll go ahead and, and take a break. Um, well, I'm going to keep going, but I just, just split up this video and then and I'll finish the rest, the smaller part of it, uh, um, right now in a second. So I'll have two 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 lectures up there because you know sometimes you don't want to go too long. And there's lots of research that shows in teaching, if you teach more than 20 minutes or so, actually, you tend, you can't help but let your mind wander a bit. So, you know, when I lecture in class, we'll take a break in the middle and then we'll come back because uh, no one, even the, as fascinating as I am, can, can you, that attention level be the same. So I'll go ahead, uh, um, uh, my introductory material, and I'll put up a second lecture now that will uh, look at the class dynamics and give you some more introductory stuff. All right, hope you guys enjoyed. And we'll stop this.